Well, our program today is called Breaking Down Stereotypes and Building Trust. Again, that's Breaking Down Stereotypes and Building Trust, and it's being presented by Diane Skanga. Diane began her career in law enforcement as a civilian cadet in Kirkwood. Uh, she attended the St. Louis Greater Police Academy in 1977, graduated from the FBI National Academy in 1988, and then from the FBI Law Enforcement Executive Development Association in 2017. And as you probably well know, both of those uh, FBI programs are very highly respected within the law enforcement community. Diane has served as director of Jefferson College's Public Safety Program since 2007. She was a history maker here at the college. She was our first ever Jefferson College Campus Police Chief from 2013 to 18. She was also employed with the Kirkwood Police Department for 31 years. Um, let's tell you how smart she is. She worked in all areas within the department except juvenile yeah. and drugs. <laughs> <laughs> Friends, I can tell you there's two things you probably sometimes want to stay away from. Juveniles and drugs. And Diane is smart enough that, that, she, that she did. Uh, seriously though, she says that the best job of all of her assignments was working as a motor officer in the traffic division. Uh, in that job, she was promoted to the rank of sergeant in 1985, lieutenant in 1992, and then captain in 2001. Aside from um, the things that she does on a professional basis, she's also given back to her community by volunteering her time with a number of different organizations. They include the FBI National Academy Associates Executive Board for eight years, where she was also served as a president. Also, the FBI National Academy Associates Eastern Missouri Chapter Executive Board for five years, a multi-jurisdictional mobile response team for seven years, the Missouri Law Enforcement Athletic um, Federation Board for 15 years, and then the Law Enforcement Officials of Greater St. Louis Executive Board for five years. Now, she's here today to share with us the challenges of a woman entering the law enforcement in the 1970s who has had to learn how to be one of the guys, while maintaining her femininity and as well as her identity in the male-dominated career. And so to quote Diane, she said, it was a ride, it was exciting, and most of all, it was an experience that I would never change. So please join me in welcoming Chief Diane Skin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, if anybody has trouble hearing me, let me know. I normally have been told that I project pretty well. Uh, I'm pretty loud, so if you have problems, please let me know and I'll use the mic. But otherwise, I kind of like to walk around. Uh, with the juvenile, I, I like juveniles. I like kids. I don't like juveniles' parents. That's why I typically, I didn't want to be, be a juvenile. And I didn't work drugs because you're just supposed to say no to drugs. I was taught that from day one, so I just, I kept that going through there. So. Hopefully today we'll have, we'll have some discussion and, and I, I kind of go at this a little bit different like I do everything. Uh, I go at everything a little bit different apparently I've been told over the years uh, by multiple bosses. So we're, we're going to keep that, that strain going a little bit, okay? Uh, like Roger said, I, I, I like to get back to the community and in addition to the law enforcement organizations, we're also <coughs> with the uh, Special Olympics Missouri we do the polar plunge at the academy. I get the recruits involved with the polar plunge. And I know that I've hit up several of you in the crowd in different committees that I'm on at the, uh, at the school with, hey, I need some money for the polar plunge. And they did it. And this year, we got the golden plunger again for our costumes. So I make costumes for the recruits as well. So we have a lot of fun. We have to take the job seriously, but we don't have to take ourselves seriously. And so that's what this is all about. And hopefully, I can share some experiences. And like I said, I, I wouldn't change a thing. Um, I started out when I was 19, probably too naive to understand that there were challenges that I didn't even realize I was going to have, and there were things that I did that I didn't even realize it was a challenge until after I got done doing it, you know? So, and then you went, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, it might have been an obstacle somebody was trying to put in my way, and I just plowed right through it. That's kind of a little headstrong. You're probably going to pick up on that a little bit. So. That's me. <laughs> I'm, I'm the tall one, okay? <laughs> um, so I was, that's when I'm at 
actually being sworn in as a commission officer, uh, I didn't have to get sworn in as a civilian employee cadet, and those fabulous hats, they finally got rid of those. Well, those were actually called meter maid hats. God love them. Yeah. Um, and nothing made you feel prettier than that meter maid hat. Um, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, back then, uh, all the uniforms were male uniforms. I kid with everybody. I've been cross-dressing for 40 years, you know? <laughs> Before it was cool, I was cross-dressing. It was no big deal. That's what I did. Uh, and I didn't see it as a challenge because I had to, I wore guys clothes all the time. I was a tomboy and I was bigger than most of the girls and when I was growing up, you know, girls had to wear slacks because we didn't wear jeans so you had to wear slacks and they always came up to about here on me. Um, and to this day, I will not wear a pair of capris. I'm telling you that right now. <laughs> nope, not going to do it. Will not wear a capri because that means that pant is too short. Not happening to this girl here, okay? I'm not bitter. Don't get, don't get me wrong. No. No issues with that at all, though. So that's when I was getting sworn in. Just so that you understand, you know, um, when I talk about this was a ride, it really was a ride. Um, and the rest of the presentation is going to be a snapshot of things that happened along the way and, <coughs> and what I did to be one of the guys. You know, you don't have to act like a guy to be one of the guys. And I always tried to pride myself on acting like a lady until I, I couldn't. You know, and I'm going to refer to several people along the way that were my mentors and were my coaches. And I think why, and, and I believe that I've been successful in, in not only my job as a police officer, but as my career as a mother and a wife. Um, and it's because I've surrounded myself with, with people who believed in me. Uh, I'd like to say I did it all, but I didn't. You know, you, you can't do it by yourself. You have to have people help you. And, and I think that was been, that's been part of why this has been easier for me than maybe some other people had, had more obstacles or, or they let obstacles get in their way a little bit more than, than I did. Uh, a little bit of a disclaimer, I'm not normal. I'm <laughs> uh, probably not a shock to most of you who've met me before. Uh, n not really a news flash there at all. But I see things just a little differently. I, was, uh, I had a grandmother uh, that was born probably about 50 years before her time. And she was just such an incredibly, the brightest woman I've ever met in my life, incredibly strong and just incredibly insightful and <coughs> common sense and just a lo in love with life and just took every opportunity to grab it and go. And so that's, that, that's where I got my drive, I think. And that's where I got my ability to believe that I can do anything. Now, it was a shock when I realized I couldn't be a ballerina. <laughs> no matter how bad I wanted to be a ballerina, it was never going to happen. I, I finally had to come to that realization. And so then I thought, well, what else can I do? Um, I couldn't type. And uh, so office, office stuff was out, out of the question. So I was lucky enough when I was 18 years old, uh, just before I turned 18, I got to do a ride along with the St. Louis County police officer. This was in 1974. The whole idea of women in law enforcement, that wasn't a particularly grand idea at the moment, you know? And I got in the car with this officer, and he was probably in his 30s, which I thought, oh my God, I can't believe he's still working, okay? <laughs> um, and so I get in the car, and he was such a such a professional and such a gentleman and when you know I don't know I, that I particularly like this idea of women in law enforcement I know people are talking about it um, but if this is what you want to do this is these are the things that you have to do on your end this is your responsibility if you want to be a part of this world and it was just strictly what education do you need what fitness levels do you need to be at, what, you know, this is your responsibility. I'm not saying you should or shouldn't do it, but if you want to do it, you've got to take responsibility for this part so that then we can even entertain the idea of hiring you. Okay, fine. So I'm, I'm good with that. So to this day, I understand that that was a key 
point in me being able to go into law enforcement because I did a ride along about six months later and it was a completely different experience and I would have never gone into law enforcement if that would have been my first experience. But because I, I was blessed with getting this professionalist, Dallas Medow, and he was just a true gentleman and a true professional and said, this is your responsibility. And I was raised like that. If you want something, you have to do your part to get it as well. And so he reinforced that, that this is what you need to do if you want this to happen to you. So every once in a while you see just little snapshots of things that are important to me. This is my success as a mom and a wife. Um, my son is now 35, my daughter's 36, and they are the, they are, that's my career right there. My job was a police officer, but that was my career was being a parent. And they always knew that. They knew I could get another job. I couldn't get another family. But that was part of the quality people that I surrounded myself with. And I surrounded, and, and I was lucky enough to meet a man who was willing to put up with me. Because I had been told, you know, you're never, you want to go into law enforcement, you ride a motorcycle, and you want to go into law enforcement, and you work on cars, and you think you're going to get married. Yeah. Tell me how that's going to work out for you, okay? Yeah. You need to compromise. You need to, you need to just start doing some girl stuff, you know, and that's how you, that's how you catch a man, okay? <laughs> but for whatever reason, I, I got him, okay? Now, his last name's Skanga, that's Italian, and I had always told, and I told my grandmother this, my mentor. When I get married, it's going to be six foot four, blonde hair, blue eyes. <laughs> None of that happened. Okay. None of that happened. And my grandmother told me when I told her, I said, I'm, I'm not going to date anybody unless they're six. Like I had people knocking on my door because you know when you ride a motorcycle and work on cars, that's the girl they want to date. Um, and they said, uh, uh, she said, you're going to marry a short man. Not me. Uh-uh. <laughs> she was a woman well before her time. So anyway, so it has been a ride. And literally, it's been a ride. Uh, when I took my application in for, I was going to criminal justice uh, at Merrimack, and I took my application into the police department, and I was on my motorcycle. That's Because that's the only transportation I had. That's all I could afford. I didn't have a car yet. So... I had my motorcycle and I happened to run into the chief of police, which I didn't know was the chief at the time. And I said, I'm here to turn in this application for this cadet program that you have. I had no idea what it was. And, uh, but it was a job and it paid and it had insurance. So I'm thinking, well, this could be good. And he saw the helmet and he said, so you ride a motorcycle? I said, yes, sir, I, I do. You know, and you want to be a police officer? And I said, well, actually, I, I want to be the chief. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I do, first impression. Oh, yeah. So, um, I, I know to this day, part of the reason why I got hired was because I rode a motorcycle. Because he knew at that moment, he could put me on, we had Harleys at the police department. He could put me on the Harleys, and I was going to be the first female motor cop in the region. And that was going to be a feather in his cap. Does that bother me? Absolutely not. That got me a job. Then it was my responsibility to show them they made the right decision. That's when my responsibility came into play with this. Um, he liked it because my hair was so long back then, I couldn't even put it up in the helmet. And so I had it braided, and everybody called, do you know you got a guy on a bike with a braid? <laughs> <laughs> I got called sir a lot. Yeah. So, but it's been a ride, wouldn't change a thing, absolutely wouldn't change a thing. But again, that was one of those things that you never know what opportunity is going to open itself up and why it's going to open itself up. But your idea is in what you do with it. So my question is, who thought women in law enforcement was going to be a good idea? Back in 74, back in 76, not many people did. Unless you looked like Angie Dickinson, okay, then they were willing to talk. Um, and as you can see, I don't look like Angie Dickinson. <laughs> she probably doesn't get called sir a lot. I'm just thinking. So um, it, they didn't think it was a good idea. 
But what you, what commissioned females were back then, you were police women. I was I was the first commissioned police officer. Well, back then it was patrolman. I was the first commissioned patrolman uh, because. Everybody, it, it, the only other female we had, had been a clerk, and they made her a policewoman so that she could do juvenile stuff. Because, you know, women are good with kids. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so, that's what they did. And then they did sexual assaults. That's, that's what police women did. You didn't patrol, you didn't go out on the street, because it was dangerous out there, and it was dark at night, and who knows what could happen to you. So. Police women were a little bit different. Now, not on TV. She was fabulous. I'd like to think I was Angie Dickinson in real life. <laughs> but I'd like to think I could be a ballerina one day, too. And that did, that did so back then, it, no, not many people thought it was a good idea. So whose responsibility was it to change their mind? You know, and I took on that role. That's what I thought it was my responsibility. We did a lot of PR. I got to do a lot of PR when I first started because First of all, I look fabulous in uniform, right? Yeah, yeah. That looks like, I'm sorry, sir, what did you say your name was? So, but I did a lot of PR stuff because they wanted a female in, in, out there in, in the public. They, they wanted that, and that's great. And you might have picked up on it, but I love to talk. So uh, being able to go out and talk to groups and going into schools, and I mean, that was my cup of tea. That was, I am in hog heaven. Let's go. Party on. That, that's exactly. So I didn't mind being used as a PR tool because you're going to hear me say this several times. If you're in the spotlight, dance. I don't care why you're in the spotlight. If you're doing your job well, everyone is seeing you do your job well. I work with guys all, I mean, we had 50 commissioned officers at Kirkwood Police Department and the majority of the time, 48 of them were males. They had to compete to get people to watch what they were doing so people could see them do their job right. I had people watching me all the time do my job right. It was perfect. I saw that as the greatest, greatest benefit that I could ever have. Were the eyes always on me? Yes. Did I have to do my job well all the time? Yes. Isn't that kind of why I was paid? Wasn't that the expectation that you should do your job well all the time? So it worked out in my favor. So I knew when I went in, as naive as I was, it didn't take me long to understand not everybody was as excited about this as I was. So I finally figured it out, I, and I accepted the fact not, I was not invited to this party. I invited myself to this party. I knocked on the door. Somebody made the mistake of opening it up, and I just walked right on in. So I understood that not everyone was going to like me. And at first, that kind of hurt my feelings, because I thought I was pretty likable. <laughs> really did. And the first time I rode with, an, with a senior officer, and he'd been there probably 20 years by then, so now we're talking a guy that started in law enforcement in 1956, the year I was born. Now I'm riding along with him, and he says, I'm in the car with him maybe 20, 30 minutes, and he hasn't said a word. Hasn't said good morning, take a long walk off a short dock, there's the door, I mean nothing. He has not said a word. So I finally said, I said, George, I said, have I done something to offend you? Because if I have, I need to apologize because I, 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 I'd like for this next seven hours and 40 minutes to be a little more comfortable than it's been so far. And he, he looked right at me and he goes, this is a waste of time. And I said, what's a waste of time? He said, females in law enforcement is a waste of time. You're never going to be able to do the job. Okay. He was one of the few people who believed that, but at least had the kahunas to tell me that. See how I clean that up? So, yeah. So I had to respect him for that because not everybody has to like me. I get that. I had to accept that, that not everyone's going to like me or approve of what I do or that I want to be a part of the show. That, and that's okay, but at least I knew where he stood instead of having somebody be nice to my face and then not so nice behind my back. So that was okay. And over time, George and I actually became pretty good friends. 
Um, we always had kind of a unique relationship. As long as he was a rank ahead of me, he was really nice to me. But every time I'd catch up to his rank and we were peers, maybe he wasn't as nice as he could have been. You know? But again, he doesn't have to like me. We never invited one another over for holiday dinners. It's not that big of a deal. We didn't share carpool ride to work or anything like that. So he didn't have to like me. It was okay. I could live with it. But understood, you know, it, it wasn't their responsibility to make me feel at home. It, I really never felt that way that it was their responsibility. So I made that conscious decision that this journey was my journey. And they were going to come along for the ride. They didn't know it yet, but they were going to come along for the ride. So it, those, those were decisions that I made. My journey, I'm going to take it with me. The challenges were mine to accept. It didn't matter who presented the challenges. I have to accept the challenge to be able to succeed. I can't say, well, you've, you've given me this challenge, and I really don't think I want to accept it. Can, so can we just, can I just succeed without really taking on that challenge? That doesn't make sense. So I decided that the challenges were mine to accept. What really caught them off guard were my expectations were I chose what the expectations of me were. And my expectations always were higher than theirs were. But I, I was always told, you do 110%. And, and if you're, you're falling behind, then you do 120% if you have to. And so it was my decision to say, these are my expectations of me. And so I was the one that was challenging myself even more than the agency or the officers who may not have thought that this was a good idea. You know, there were a lot of things that came, and I think the successes were mine to achieve. There were challenges that the city wasn't ready for. The city of Kirkwood, you all know the city of Kirkwood, you, you know, it, it's a very well established city and back in the 70s, the majority of the people who worked at City Hall had worked at City Hall for a really, really long time. And so here I come in, this young female, I end up getting married, you know, marry the man of my dreams there, you know, I, didn't know it, but you know, yeah. So I ended up getting married. I was married almost five years before we finally decided to have children. And what a bombshell when I go into City Hall and let him know I'm going to have a child. What? <laughs> you floozy, you, you know? What are we going to do with a female law enforcement officer, a commission officer, pregnant? What are we going to do? We're, they had no clue. Nobody had thought of that. Nobody had a clue what to do with me. Not a clue. Didn't, didn't, yeah. And, and really, I got the impression like I was a little bit of a loose woman there because I'd only been married five years, you know? And uh, if you're going to give it up, I don't know, you know, five years, I don't know. So we had to go through that kind of evolution of policies and procedures and, you know, how long could I be out on the street and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, um, we, we, unfortunately, there have been... Um, abuses of sick leave that m created a, a, well, what are you going to do? How, how are you, you know, I used my sick leave when I wasn't working on the street. I worked up, a, my first pregnancy, I worked on the street until I was five months pregnant. That's what my OBGYN told me I was safe to do because, I mean, you've got a bill, you've got, you know, all this stuff on. And nobody on the street except my dispatcher and my chief knew that I was pregnant because I didn't want anybody to know. Because had I done it, because by that time I'd been with the police department for eight years, had, as soon as they found out, I couldn't, they wouldn't let me answer calls anymore. Because they were gonna take care of me. Yeah. Which was adorable. <laughs> but not fair to them. You know, I'm still responsible for doing my job. So for the last week that I was out on the street, every time there'd be a call come out, you know, a disturbance call or a this or a that, I've got it, I've got it, you can disregard, you can disregard it. It's like, no, 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 that's why I didn't tell you I was pregnant. 
because they were going to take care of me. You know, and then I got to go into dispatch because we happened to have an opening and I made a maternity top. You know, and it looked like a police shirt, but it was a maternity, t maternity <laughs> top, you know. And which, it worked out really well because then I didn't have to like try to figure out what to wear when you're... <laughs> I was healthy. <laughs> I was really healthy. You know that eating for two? Totally took that to heart. Totally. Okay. So those were, those were the kind of things that I had to help the city with their challenges on how to accept those kind of normal everyday life happenings with females that they hadn't had to worry about with males. You know, um, which was fun. It, it ended up, everybody had a good time. You know, we laugh about it now. I, I still see my old chief periodically and he's still like, I can't believe you did that to me. <laughs> so, he's like, really get over it. You're 84. Come on, move on. Let's go on. Yeah, there's other things that you can concentrate on now, okay? So, um, like I said, the, the wisest woman I ever met was my grandmother. And she taught me a long time ago that you treat people, how you treat people is a reflection of you. And you all have been at my graduations and you know that we, we teach the recruits that, or we try to teach the recruits the same thing. Not only as a police officer, but as a person, you treat people, how you treat people is a reflection of you, not, not a reflection of them. You know, because once you start treating people the way they're acting, now they control you. And I, and I knew I, I couldn't let people control me and still succeed. Because when I, when I decided that I was going to be, I wanted to be the best that I could be in law enforcement. Not the best female, not the best patrolman, not the best sergeant, the best officer, the best professional that I could be in, in law enforcement. That was when those expectations continued to get set. And nobody put those expectations on me but me. Those were, that's what I demanded, okay? So when I decided I was going to be the best, I had to have a plan. So early on, I started making sure that I could physically handle anything that I needed to handle. And I talk to people a lot about this a lot. I don't believe that I'm equal to a man. I never have. I'm equivalent. I can do the same job, but I get to do it differently just because I'm a female. I get to do things differently. People react to me differently on the street just because I'm a female. I can walk into a disturbance call and there'll be a man who will be calling his wife everything but sweetheart. And as soon as he sees me and realizes that sometimes it takes a tick for him to realize I'm a girl, he'll apologize for his language to me. So if I go in there and start treating him the way he's acting and I start using <laughs> profanity to try to talk to him, he's not going to apologize to me. And he wouldn't apologize to a male officer. But for some reason, they'd suddenly think that it was appropriate to apologize. And I let them do it because it was de-escalating what was going on. So I'm doing the same job, but I get to do it differently just on the, on the resources that I have as a female. That's all it took. Now, understand way back in the 70s, and I, this is how I settled my grandmother down when I told her I was going to be a police officer. Back then, and still today, most men will not hit a woman. It's a little more prevalent than it used to be, unfortunately, but men don't typically hit women. It's just not manly, okay? And of the men who would hit a woman, I'm bigger than a lot of them. <laughs> So they have to think about it for a minute and go, what happens if she hits back? <laughs> that may not end well for me, you know? So what I did was I made sure that physically the guys knew if I was their backup, I was going to be able to control somebody. Or if I was the first one on the scene, they weren't going to have to take care of me. I was going to be able to take care of myself. And the majority of my fitness first started with triathlons. I did not do that well. <laughs> I finished, I got t-shirts, you know, but it started my path on physical fitness. And then I found powerlifting and that was my niche. And so I've, I'm German, I'm, I can lift that weight, okay? And I was ranked nationally and suddenly they thought, okay, she can handle herself, it's okay. 
And with the Missouri Police Olympics, I, I you know, participated in the firearms, so they knew that I was a really good shot, and they knew that I took my defense tactics seriously. I was with the mobile response team, and we did a lot of extra training in physical defense and in, in uh, riot control and all that. So I put myself in a position to get as much training as I possibly could so that I wasn't the girl. I was the female officer, but I wasn't the girl. And so that was up to me to be able to be the backup. Mentally, I made sure that I trained to win all the time. You have to train like you're going to work. You know, and, and you train like you fight. And if you don't, you're going to lose. And I do not lose well. I'm not, I'm not a good loser. I don't. I'm okay with the grandkids. I'll let them win. <laughs> periodically, <laughs> just to give them a little boost when they need it, but I'm not a good loser. And then socially, I, I truly believe that I can act like a lady 90% of the time. And as long as I act like a lady, I was typically treated like a lady. Not all the time, there's nothing, nothing's written in stone, and this is generalization, but it worked for me really well. So if I act like a lady, I'd be treated like a lady. And that's whether I was working with people out on the street or whether I was working with my coworkers or I was working with people at church or as I was working with people in organizations. So if I acted like a lady, they treat me like one until I couldn't act like a lady anymore. And then I had the mentality and the physical prowess to not have to be a lady anymore. Then I could be whatever I needed to be to control the situation so I wasn't the girl. And then it comes down to academically. You know, I wanted to make sure if I was going to, Kirkwood was really strong in education and I thank them for that now. Um, and so when it came time for promotions for sergeant and when it came time for promotions to lieutenant and to captain, I had the academic background that I could get those extra points. And, and Kirkwood was big on physical fitness, so we had to do physical fitness assessment, assessments for all of our promotions. So I was able to keep up with everybody else the same thing. So even though I could, when I wasn't in a uniform, I dressed like a girl. <laughs> I always had long hair so that when I wasn't in uniform, I didn't look like a policeman. I could look like a mom. I could look like a wife. I could just, you know, but when I was at work, I was a police officer. I was a professional. That's what I was getting paid to do. Did everybody like me? No. Did a lot of people like me? I think so. I'm pretty likable. But <laughs> I think what I did was I took it upon myself to say, this is what I want to do. You're not excited about it, but let me show you what I'm capable of doing and earn your respect. Earn your trust. You know, earn the ability to be one of the guys even when I'm still a girl. It's okay. One of the biggest compliments I had, and I'll end with this, one of the biggest com I think I'm gonna, yeah. That's Mike Swoboda. He was killed in the Kirkwood City Hall shootings. He, he promoted me to, to captain. That, that's one of my favorite pictures. He, he was there to promote me to captain. Um, he, when I was um, on the street, and I was riding the motors, and I was with another, another officer. We were watching school traffic. And a gentleman came up, and he was talking to us. And, and I was newer on the street back then. And so he asked Tom, Tommy Von Hatton. He says, so, Officer Von Hatton, he goes, uh, who's the new fella pointing over at me? Because I told you. <laughs> OK. So he said, well, that's one of the new cadets. That's uh, Cadet Skanga, or Cadet Vineyard. I was still a maiden name then. And so then that was the big joke when we got back to roll call. You know, hey, meet the new fella. Meet the new guy. Meet the new fella. And so now the next day when I came in to work, unbeknownst to them, I had a little bit of a mole in the police department. They had, um, when I got off of work the next day, they had taken everything out of my locker and put it in the men's locker room since I was one of the guys. Okay. So, but I knew that was going to happen. So I didn't get offended. I thought it was cute. I thought it was fun. So what I did was I had all my gym clothes underneath my uniform. And at the end of shift, I go into the locker room. I start stripping down. Okay? 
Now, I didn't get past unbuttoning my shirt. They didn't even know I had clothes on underneath it because they scattered, okay? They were like, holy crap, you know? So, yeah, so karma, yeah, it, it came back. But those were the kind of, you have to have fun. You have to take the job seriously, but you don't have to take yourself seriously. And you take opportunities to see where, when they're embracing you. And they didn't do it to embarrass me. They actually, that was truly, that was an act of endearment. And so for me to be offended by that would have just destroyed so much trust and so much of the camaraderie that we had built up over the time. So um, wouldn't change a thing. Love everything I've ever done. Um, I, my kids, the, all the kids at my kids' school called me SWAT. I was the SWAT mom because when I was on the special uh, mobile response team, we had to wear our black TDUs when we did training. So I dropped the kids off at school, so I was SWAT mom. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it, it was just, I wouldn't change a thing. Is, does anybody have any questions? I, yes, sir. On the matter of being liked or not liked, uh, You've kind of given away your age, so do you did you ever see the Kojak TV series? Oh, absolutely. Okay. And, yeah. And do you ever watch Blue Bloods? Yes. Yeah. Are maybe there's no reality there at all, but are police forces so uniformly rude, gruff, and in your face to each other as as portrayed? No. Or? No. No. They're not. Yeah. And, and there are there people who are like that? Yes. Are there agencies that are like that? Typically not the whole agency. And and I don't I don't watch a lot of the cop shows. Um, I watch NCIS, I gotta admit, because <laughs> Mark Harmon is hot. Okay. <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, it has nothing to do with law enforcement, but yeah. So but no, they're not really in their face. Now, what I have found is typically the and, and this, is, this is my personal experience, and I, I hope I don't offend anybody. Most of the women who I have found who've had a difficult time breaking into the world of law enforcement either tried to be one of the guys, you know, or they expected to be treated differently. There have been several female officer organizations that have tried to, to creep up, so the females can, can bond. And I'm like, but all you do is, because I've gone to make to see what it's about, and all they do is gripe about the guys. But you're not talking to the guys, so nothing's going to change. So if you don't like being segregated, why are you segregating yourself? I don't understand that. So I all think life, differently. All my life, except for close friends, if somebody were to address me by my last name, I always look at as they don't really respect me or don't, or maybe don't like me. But but that's another staple of like Kojak's. Oh yeah, program. and and is last that, names are just what it is because especially when you're new on an agency, you would never call anybody by their first name, and so you learn them as Sergeant So and So, and then as you rise up, you just start calling by last name. It, it that's just what it is because out on the street, even our reports are always by last name. You know, when when we're writing a report, we're talking about the victim, witness, suspect, always by last name. It's just there's too many Dianes, but there's only one Skanga. You know, so yes, sir. Yeah, I, I want to congratulate you on your on your way you went through and the way you worked. And, and I worked at a actually I worked at an outside utility, and we had to incorporate girls into the outside construction. Yeah. Okay. I seen two concepts of that. I seen some come in and they kind of did like what you did. Yeah. You know, they they they, they tried to, they did their work what they couldn't do. But then I seen others came in there and all of a sudden the guys weren't. Cologne that's working with her and he's yeah. shoveling for her. Yeah. And that created a lot of discontent. Oh, the there, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. The wives did not like me. Oh, oh, oh no. Wow. It took a long time for wives, especially when I was still single, for the wives to accept that there was a female in law enforcement. Um, and I trained a male officer. And I had a, well, when I trained, I had a male officer, was my field training officer, and his wife told him that we would not eat together unless it was in a public place. She was, you know, and I'm like, really? And, and he was a sweetheart. I love Jack Schneedle to the, to the moon back, don't get me wrong, but it's like, no, Jack, no, you, not my type, no, yeah. And, and, and he didn't ride bikes. Yeah. What, what did I have? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and, and we mentioned earlier, you know, the Kojak needs to be out. <laughs> For all, I'm not serious. I, I mean, to, to young people coming up. Well, I, I get to, I, I, that's one of the joys of being part of the Law Enforcement Academy, 
is um, I do get, I feel like I have a little bit of a voice with the new, the new recruits, you know, and the new professionals that are coming out and letting them know that, you know, it's not, the world really doesn't revolve around them. I'm not sure even their, their mom told them it did. It, it doesn't, yeah. And so that's the joy of getting to do what I do at the academy now, in addition to still being commissioned with the campus police department. I'm at the academy and I do get to, I feel like I get to be a little bit of a voice. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry, Mike. Yeah. What, what percentage of females are in the academy? Uh, right now we have in probably a fourth. We're running about 20%, 20, 25% right now. But then we had one class that was 50% female. It's, it, it, it's a hit and miss. It's a very unique profession for anybody, for male or female. It's a very unique profession. It takes a unique kind of personality and, and, and a, a, a way. And for females, it's even a smaller percentage that are really going to fit into that niche because if you don't have the support system to help with childcare and you're, you know, what happens is we hire a lot of young females and then they end up either getting married and their husband doesn't want to be a police officer anymore or they end up having kids and now they have, they have to worry about child care with midnights and weekends and holidays and so it, it, there's a very, you have to have a super strong uh, support system to, to be able to do it. Yeah. Somebody, anybody else? I, I was just going to say on that same sort of note, obviously you're the only female for two of you out of 50. What do you say now is the percentage of officers? Female officers, I, probably still 12 to 15 percent. Yeah, and it and it, we're getting new females all the time, but about the time we get new ones in, their other ones are rotating out because of family commitments, or they've decided they want to go into another field. It's not what they thought it was going to be. Yeah, but it, it's pretty consistently 12 to 15 percent. That that's the, on a good day. That's where we're hitting. Yes. So sort of related to your areas of instruction. There is a stereotype of young people today, and, and everybody gets to play this game, young people today, Yeah. Uh, that they're very fragile creatures. They can't deal with adversity, and they just fold and run away. Is First of all, is that your experience of the populations you work with? And given your background, how do you try to work with people who need help in that area? Well, we attract people who aren't quite as fragile um, because they... They, they, a lot of times we get people who have a background with um, either family violence or a lot of drug use or something like that and they want to change that. When we do get somebody in who just can't deal with conflict, who can't, you know, we work with them as much as we can. We start giving them exercises. We give them opportunities to start communicating and building those skills. But we've had, we've had recruits that have come through and completed their associate degree but have not tested because they would not be safe police officers out on the street. Just because you get into the academy doesn't automatically mean that you're eligible to test for post because you still have to be a safe officer when you get out there and be able to handle physically, mentally, psychologically what you're going to be able to do. Or call they uh, it's, mo normally it's mutual. There's only been one where I've had to, I've had to absolutely make the call. And then about six weeks later they came back and told me that they were glad I did. They, they tried to defend themselves when it happened, but about six weeks later after it soaked in and they realized, then they, they did come back. And which was nice. It wasn't necessary because they were, I knew that I was keeping somebody alive. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes, sir. I'll be right back. Is there anything with the girls going to the academy as far as size is concerned? No, well... Law enforcement used to be, you had to be five foot ten, you had to be this, you had to be that, yeah, and those are all gone now. Um, and there's, we, we have a lot of small girls come through, and those are conversations that we have with those. You have to decide if size is going to be an issue, what do you have to do to overcome that? So you've got to be better at defense tactics than, than anybody else. You've got to be better at your communication skills and de-escalation than anybody else. And, you know, because if you do your defense tactics right, size is still an issue, but not nearly as paramount as you believe it is if you take the time to be the best that you need to be in those defense tactics. You know, because we've had really big guys come in, and you think, well, this is great. This guy's a big guy. He'll be able to handle anything he wants to handle. 
But if he doesn't practice his defense tactics, he's just as vulnerable as a small person. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. That was pretty much my question, whether you have, from the outset, whether you have quantitative uh, limitations or requirements. He, he said, I think yeah. he said size, but weight size and strength, do you, or, or you basically let anybody in, or do you have some kind of limitations where, hey, don't even bother your... We have a physical assessment that they have to take throughout the year while they're in there, and by the time they graduate, they have to meet minimum standards and push up, sit up, or run time. You have to do a mile and a half, and if you're between 20 and 29, you have to do a mile and a half in 12 minutes and 18 seconds. So you're, you you got to do eight minute miles. And so that gets that cardio. And like I told them, 31 years at Kirkwood, I never chased anybody a mile and a half. I mean, that's why they give us cars and radio. You know, I mean, I, I never chased anybody. I'm, you know, I mean, I did triathlons and knew I wasn't good at it, okay? But what that mile and a half run is, is assessing, what that evaluation is, you can keep throwing punches for three minutes that your cardiovascular system, your aerobic system is strong enough that you can keep throwing punches for three minutes. You can keep throwing punches for three minutes, your survivability goes way, way up. And I have had to fight people for three minutes. So, yeah, yes, I'll be right back. Our granddaughter is, loves it, she went through your class. She's at Kirkwood. Yeah, now oh, Brianne? Yes. <laughs> she's getting the next guy, she's gonna be in field training for the next guy she, going to Kirkwood. She's, she's dating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and it's weird, you know. A lot of police hook up just because we we we're weird yeah. people. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And we need the weird, you know. And if you're not used to the weirdness, it gets really weird. We never thought she was weird. Never thought she was yeah. weird. Well, see, and my husband, God love him, he ended up getting shot. Um, and he's okay, well, as okay as he was before he got shot, but, um, you know, I mean, but they called me to tell me he got shot, because, well, I was a police officer. You know, I could handle that. You know, so at 11 o'clock at night, I got a six-month-old baby at home, and I get a phone call that, yeah, John's been shot. And I thought, they said he got shot in the hand, and I thought he said he's got shot in the head. Uh -oh. And I'm thinking, that can't be good, you know, but it, it worked out, he's fine. <laughs> I thank you for your chosen profession, but at the same time, I worry about your safety. You know, and that's good, and I'm glad, and I appreciate that. Thank you. My kids worried about it, but what they did was I always had a poem, the policeman's prayer, and Milo the guard dog. My son, I, I finally a year ago, I washed Milo for the last time. Um, and but he gave me, he drew a picture of Milo the guard dog. And so I always had that in my pocket, and that made my kids feel safe. And I tell them, I'd say, yeah, what I do is dangerous, but I'm trained to take care of myself. So all the other moms that you go to school with, they're not trained to protect themselves or you, but I am. So, you know, and my son to this day, when I'm in uniform, he'll tap my chest to make sure I got my vest on. And he's 35. Mm -hmm. He still taps my chest when I'm in uniform to make sure I got my vest on. <laughs> oh, yeah, they, they watch out for me there. Yeah. So I appreciate your time so much. I know I ran over and I apologize, but thank you so much. And tell Brian I said hi. Thank you very much.